Well, welcome to a Rich Martin podcast. So good that you're able to tune into this again. And today I have got Steve and Angie Campbell, who run an amazing church in England in Cambridge. I explain a little bit more before um, the interview with them. They're a really, really special couple and I really enjoyed this whole conversation, which I know you will too. If you like it, why not share it, send it to some people because it really, really does encourage me when I see that and other people get help too. So massive thanks and I hope you enjoy it like I did. Over to Steve and Angie Campbell. Well, it's great to be here with Steve and Angie Campbell, and uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of an intro for those that don't know them. They've been spending the last 28 years leading C3 Cambridge, which is based in Cambridge, which is this really posh city in the UK. And uh, they have also got other campuses around the UK, uh, around Cambridge, actually. And they also have a big online presence as well for people that are tuning in online. Um, it's a church that's really well known. It's got a great, great reputation here in the UK and beyond. They've also got three amazing kids and grandchildren as well. So we're speaking to real life grandparent pastors, which is quite good. And their reputation in the UK I touched on and beyond is that if you talk to people about Stephen and Angie Campbell, they kind of come back with similar comments, which is things like what great leaders they are, or they're the real deal, or they're incredibly authentic. And so I want to thank you guys for being with us. I want to spend some time talking into your 28 year, a year's journey, which we're not going to do much justice to it, but I'd love to try to see if we can to encourage some people. So a huge, huge thank you for being on here with me. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. And for those for those that can't see, Angie and Steve are sat on the most incredible backdrop, which is the world's largest bookcase. I think they've actually just yeah. snuck into the local library and I've put on that Zoom. Have I read all those books? And my answer is I've read some on <laughs> all of them. That might be with some of them just the outer binder. I like. <laughs> I'm exactly the same. <laughs> I cheat. I'm an audible man much more now than I am anything else. So but it's so good to have you. I would love to start for one of you if you could just give us a what has 28 years? What does that mean? It's a big point there to Angie. What does it look like? Where how's that happened? Um, how have you, you know, you've done the same church in the same city with the same husband, same wife. For, <laughs> for, 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 there's no scandal to come out here, guys. Oh, <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> this wouldn't be the place to reveal it. Anyway. It wouldn't be, no. I think you'd have to go to a bigger platform than this. <laughs> but, you know, 28 years is 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 incredible. And so it started in 1994. Yeah. What 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 happened? How have we got to where we're at? What's the kind of brief synopsis there, Andrew? Okay, where do I begin? Um, we met at a very early age, and uh, I mean a really early early age. We were in Sunday school together, um, and I was twelve, and he was fourteen when he asked me out. God, and I said, "What no. you, what you what's it to do with you? What I'm doing on Saturday?" And he said, "I'm asking you out." I said, "Well, I better go and ask my mum and see what's going on." I went home and told my mom she said, no way, <laughs> don't go out with him. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to jump in there straight away. <laughs> because part of the reason we've lasted so long is because we started so early. Oh and some people talk about, particularly in Christian scenes, marriage, marrying early. It's great marrying early. Yes. It's fantastic. It puts yes. some transitions in. And our relationship, because we were such good friends in Sunday school and then youth, was a great foundation for when we got married when we were 23 and 21. 23 and 21. So at an early age, we both really felt called to ministry. And um, we used to talk about ministry. We used to talk about the most important thing is to do something for God full time. We didn't know what that looked like, but we did have a sense of call over our lives. And we, I wanted to be a teacher, trained as a teacher. And then after that, we went off to Bible college together. And it was there at Bible college that it really solidified that this call was together although it was a male um only leadership college right. that had been brought up with all girls in the house went to an all girls school and then suddenly I was in uh, surrounded by this college that was all about male leadership and I was there just to stand there and applaud and say how great you've done a great job um so that's been a huge journey we then did a church in the Wirral and um at the time, uh, we bought, built that church over a number of years. And here in Cambridge, we we're part of a network and they felt that we should leave 
with a Wirral and come to Cambridge or Leeds and build it with a university uh, university town. And, the and you, missed, Cambridge... you missed out on the great city of Leeds as well. Oh, no, like... I know. It was, it was, I chose. <laughs> that was a close one. <laughs> I didn't even tell her about Leeds until afterwards. All right. Good shout. <laughs> we'd lived, we'd lived, no, no, no insult to Yorkshire. We'd lived in Yorkshire though. We'd done that. So we thought we needed you to come south. But yeah, well done. No, we were kind of tasked with either close it down or build it up. The church was struggling a little bit. It was about 150. The church is actually 40 years old. We're celebrating our 40th year um, this September. So actually, church was established um when we moved here but as i say it was small it was like it really needs some help either build it or close it down and just pausing that Andrew, you were both what age roughly you don't have to give the exact age i don't want 30 32 yeah yeah she was 30 i was 32 when we moved here in 94 so you well, do the maths guys yeah. <laughs> still super young so you're still super yeah. young so. we had a four-year-old and a two-year-old at the time wow. i obviously with us we brought them with us and um, moved away from family here so in Cambridge. the congregation that we came to because the, the church was split into three different congregations but we doubled the kids work or the kids church there was two of them and there was our two and that that was it that was four so that that was what we there was a lot of students in that mix because uh, we were in the central congregation um yeah and that was 94 and <laughs> Carry on, 30, <laughs> what do you say of the last 28 years? Because it's been reinvention after reinvention, hasn't it? Yeah, it has been lovely. And what was it? Where, so it, just because we'll come on to some of those reinventions in a minute, I'm really curious to know about those. Keep keep going, Angie. Angie was it, was it, um, it wasn't, it was a non-denominational church, right? When you took hold of it. Yeah. yeah. Part of a larger network of churches. Right. Um, so again, it was what we'd gone to the Bible College, um, Covenant Ministries. It was a church that was overseen by the Covenant Ministries. And there was a bit of a split within that um, network. And we came, we stayed alongside um, a guy called Alan Scotland and kind of like came under his leadership. But in time, we really felt that we couldn't really grow and become all that we felt God was calling us to be staying in, in that network. And it was quite a a painful time to see whether we would stay in the network or whether we would move out and become an independent church. Right. And uh, we went on that journey and in which really concluded in 2004. And um, so during that time, we were really establishing ourselves in the city, uh, really trying to get to know the city. It's such a, um, the world comes to Cambridge. So right. it's such educated city but also there's quite a lot of poverty in the city as well so we've got to know the fact that there's real pockets of poverty as well as great pockets of of affluence of wealth it's become known for us it's technology it's called silicon fen because there's a lot of technology that's come into the city it's also a lot of scientific discovery as you can imagine a lot of the university students will come out and set up business as an enterprise so you never quite know who's in your congregation on a Sunday morning it can be an expert on the I don't know cell structure or stem cell theory or all sorts you, know, you just don't know who's in your congregation right. and what we had to learn is not to be intimidated by that right. not to be intimidated by the intellect around us um, but actually keep true to the gospel and keep true to how God has created us and really to keep getting to the heart of the message mm. and to the heart of people. I think that's part of our authenticity, mm. that everybody's heart is the same. Everybody needs God, everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs you know principles of keeping going back to the word, keep going back to God. Um, and just, yeah, the healing that's needed is there for everyone, no matter how academic, sometimes even worse when you're highly <laughs> academic and you've never failed in anything that's something right. you it's crazy and so you find yourself now with um a church of quite a large church it's like a thousand people is it around about a thousand people yeah it's, it's just over that yeah it is. Um, amazing and over three locations now yeah so in the what what was always our long-term plan um if i can just jump back to, to one thing we were just saying one of the biggest battles has always been to keep church simple you know, I know this book years ago written called Simple Church. Right. It's got, I'm on there. I, I think we could write a book easily called Complicated Church because we complicate everything. We put layers on and we don't yeah, yeah. stop things. So keeping it 
the simplicity of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself has been a continual battle. It still is to this day. I would say right. the larger we've got, the harder that's got. But the more we move away from that, we're persuaded the less effective we are. Um, so we, we try to keep keep battling that all the time, keeping keeping it simple. And people have responded to that because simple doesn't mean stupid. Right. Um, and, and I remember a guy from Oxford saying to me when you're preaching, he said, don't try and preach what you think they know. So, you know, if you don't know anything about quantum physics, don't talk about quantum physics. And I don't right. talk about what you do now. You know, and, and I know about loving God and loving people. So that's one thing that we have sought to do. Right. Uh, and, and I've forgotten the question that you, you asked me that I haven't answered. Well, no, you were going to backtrack. You were going to go through three locations. Why it was always oh, that's right. yeah. yeah, the locations. What We always said we wanted a building in the, in the city. And, you know, that's been a huge journey to have our own building because literally the people who were buying buildings were Microsoft and Apple and John yeah, Lewis <laughs> yeah, and Google. So the competition was hard. So it, it, it was always, well, when we get a building, then we will church plant and we'll start other locations. Um, and that's exactly what we did. We, we managed in the end to get an old Anglican church building. So this is part of the 28 year journey. Um, we, we'd we raised five million pounds, which was great because we, we had a long term vision. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We had to get a loan for a couple of million, which, you know, was, we, we had to. But we were able to build this seven million pound building. Once we'd done that, we said, right, if we've got to stay on mission, I'd, we both observed. And this happened in the Wirral. If anyone's listening from the Wirral, we bought a building, different price. We bought an old school for thirty six thousand pounds or something did it all up it was going great did a lot in the community but we noticed how people fell in love with buildings mm. the building became the vision mm. not what you're trying to use the building for so we were going to work hard once we built the building we want to stay on mission mm -hmm. uh, which we describe as reaching and shaping a generation with the message and cause of christ and our mantra is and you said it before is, is people really matter we want to keep it people focused. I mean, I've had sermons on not being people focused. We think you should be people focused. Yeah. We think when it says God so loved the world, um, he came to, that means people, whosoever believes yeah. in him. So we yeah. keep very people focused. So we said we will plant other locations and we prayed about where. Um, and Bury St. Edmunds, we had a group that were coming from Bury St. Edmunds. So that's where we started. But we just started that when lock, when COVID hit. Um, good so planning there guys it's fantastic <laughs> but it survived in fact i'd say it's wow. fine um and and also then we, the other place we've been praying and sorry for people that are listening and for myself barista Emmons is how far from cambridge 25 miles east of cambridge so like a good 45 minute drive 40 yeah. minute drive it's a it's a market town we had people coming from there um it's very hard, you know, people say, we, we, first meeting we did in there, a guy came up to me um, and I and he told me his name and I have one of his books, this guy from my childhood. And he said, why are you coming to Bury St. Edmunds? You know, there's so many good churches. And I said, yeah, there are, but there's so many people that don't go to any church that isn't there. And I knew from his background, he'd agree with me. I won't, I won't mention him. And he said, yeah, that's true. And I said, there's some churches that probably do need to close, don't they? Because I knew his theology and I knew which churches he'd like. And right. <laughs> I'm not sure he was too keen on us. And but he did agree with that. And we, we, on that basis, if we're coming to be missional, we, you know, reach people that are far away from God. Why not? Now, have people come from other churches? Yeah, they have. <laughs> and, and and without going into huge, because I could spend a whole podcast on this, is it one church, three locations? Is it one church? Is it three, ch four churches with, you know, is it one how, church. how, how, what's the governance? Is it strict in terms of how they run it, the leadership there? Is it, do you pick the set lists every week? Is it that level or are they, I don't know. No, no, there's, so, there's a, on, on relation to the set list, there's a bank of songs you can use. Yeah, yeah. Um, We'll supply musicians where we can. We want to be singing the same songs across the sites. Okay. Um, but it is one church, four different locations. We say four because we include online as a location. Yeah. Uh, trying to build community in that. Um, and we do use video a lot. So in each of the locations, we've sought to 
provide good video technology to be able to so we record the service at 9 30 in cambridge yeah and by the time they start at 10 30 they've got that okay. so it's it's not live it's it's delayed but that that works and, right. and that works okay for us i'm not saying we'll stay with that forever um i think there are a million ways to do it you know and, and choose which one we I, I wouldn't be opposed to a preaching team yeah 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 but it's definitely that. it's definitely a centralized version of church that, that yeah. you've picked with it all right we could jump we could i mean there's so much I, I could if we i could sit in that library and smoke a cigar with you not that you'd let me not that you'd let me angie in the house okay. <laughs> you go in the garden okay in the garden thank you go well, on, sorry steve that? One of the locations that came in lockdown was Colchester. We we prayed about Colchester, but we knew no one. And and we'd actually gone to the zoo on our daughter-in-law's uh, birthday. Oh, your birthday. So I remember Casey fell over and broke a leg. But we, we went there to try and could we meet, but we met no one. And then in lockdown, someone contacted, contacted us and said, would you be willing to consider something in Colchester? Because the couple had left the church on the with, with issue of women in, in ministry and they'd been connecting with us online and we got to build it. But my point was going to be this. We got a fantastic building there, but we only got it because we put a bid in as one church. A, a church plant would not have done that wow. uh, to do that without being part of the one because we had the books to show Colchester Council. And we've seen the churches, how, how, how many people there on a Sunday now? About 140. I think. Um, wow. 37 people that have come to faith in the last year. Oh, praise God. Praise one God. Year, it's one year old this that's weekend. Like, yeah. Oh, that's so good. So good. Okay, you touched on women in ministry, Angie, 28 years ago when you first started. What I love about you guys is it's very much you are co-senior leaders. It's not steve's a senior leader and you're the you're the senior leader's wife what's that journey been like how long have you got <laughs> <laughs> it has been a long journey because as i say the background was not that so actually you know the calling that we felt together we couldn't outwork uh, for many years so it wasn't until we actually started to define what we wanted a church to look like and what we wanted government governance of the church to look like and um, that's when i could actually start kind of functioning more in in my giftings i did a lot of uh, volunteer work and i would uh, 18 years of our marriage was a lot of volunteer work but then i started to actually come on staff and then start being given more and more responsibility so uh, i'd oversee the kids then i oversee youth and then i overstood all our community enterprises everything that was external into the community and that grew and grew and that became something that I got involved in the city that helped set up the city food bank here and um, it just was lots and lots of kind of ministry areas and when God's got put gifting in you you either say you know I'm going to stay frustrated in the church that won't use me or I'll go external right. what a waste you know to actually think that the church and when we function together and build the house together is stronger you know why would you not give women space who's got obvious leadership over their lives yeah. give them the opportunity um all you know working together within team yeah. um but it, so it's been an incredible journey and at first it was a it was difficult for some of the guys who've been here a long time and yeah. some of who were then um i was getting you know a voice at the table and i was getting opportunities um, some people found that difficult and that was were not easy at times so I had yeah. to keep standing strong and know that I was called and knew it was about the kingdom knew it was about it was about my own personal walk yeah. with God um, and then finding places that I could get the support that I needed and finding other women in ministry which weren't that many around there's more these days you know to actually get alongside somebody I remember there was a talk a lady came over from Willow and I went down to London and she talked about women in ministry and I thought this is the first time I've actually gone to something I say it's okay for women to be in ministry and to be leaders in ministry it was just like a revelation there are people who actually believe the same um and it what about is on on that journey what about what's I mean not to put you on the spot with with Steve but you have to keep your mouth shut here Steve um, because I'm going to ask the question, which is, uh, how has Steve supported you in that? So what have been like the qualities of Steve? And where have you had tensions? Have you had to say, Steve, you've, you, you don't understand it? Or have there not been? Has it just been a superstar for 28 years? 
Oh yeah, it's just been amazing. Today. <laughs> In fact, we had a conversation about that yesterday because you said there's a situation where you said, but you can't understand that when a woman's experienced a sexist remark or because I had, it went over my head, but she said you you can't argue the toss on that because you've not been the the, the short end right. of that. Right. So right, I right. Quiet. Yeah. So you know, in any situation, isn't it? If you're not the person who's experiencing it, then it's hard to make a judgment about it. Say, well, that person wasn't yeah. being sexist. They didn't mean to be sexist. But then, if you've had the comment and it's been it's been directed to you, or other people have come to you and said they've felt that, then you've got to hear it because it's actually impacted you in a way that won't impact you yeah. because you're male. So. Yeah. But so, where's yeah. Steve? Where's Steve promoted? Where's Steve been? Like, I suppose what I'm at, the reason I'm asking this is really aware people are listening, uh, women are listening, and they're in ministry, but maybe they're not in ministry like you're describing, and mm -hmm. they are second. Uh, you know, it's not it's not co-leading. It's more like I support my husband who is. What's mm -hmm. Steve done to bring you forward that you like that hugely helped? I think um, talking about it, be open about it, be giving the platform, giving space, and um, talking about us rather than me, um, mm. actually about us as a team. Then something which was quite radical that we discussed, which Steve put forward and, uh, and towards the trustees, is that we get paid the same. And I think oh. that was a bit of a radical statement, really, to say that we want to be on equal pay. I mean, in, in, in effect, you know, your wage was decreased and mine was increased, but we are on equal pay. <laughs> That's so good, though. So good and healthy. Eight ones, isn't it? To say yeah. that we're functioning in this way together. Um, and I can hear him sometimes on the phone today, you know, it's like my wife will be with, with me because we co-lead the church together and we will both, I might not be the one saying prayers at this is, um, event that is going to, but we are we're coming together as a team as as two some so and where where have you had to kind of love it right where have you had to kind of fight's the wrong word but push you mentioned yesterday's scenario but have you ever that's a great scenario about the wage one that you've mentioned is there another one where you've where you've had to say no like we need to do this to to ensure it's framed right for the church and you've gone into me and my wife, it's week long discussions, but I'm sure you go into minute long discussions. But you know, you go into those like discussional times of where you're working out stuff. Can you think of anything around the women, you in ministry, and what that looks like, and how maybe you've had to push back on some things? I'm trying to think. Um, I think it's more what's in my mind is more the freedom to be able to explore that space. Hmm. So, when I wanted to set up something, um, uh, she leads retreat which okay. is about being in ministry across the country. I just had this thought that if I feel at times I'm often walking into a male-dominated environment, because mm. not necessarily within our church, uh, on board meetings or whatever, but externally when we go on to different groups, different networks, it can be male still male heavy even at the global leadership um, network we went to recently in america when you were looked in the room there were 40 people seven of them were female and so you, you're often in a situation where i um, can only be the only female there so then saying oh i want to set something up for female leaders to support the women mm. in ministry um what do you think about that and saying yeah go for it and supporting that then that speaks volumes um to me but also to the other women that there's a, a freedom to explore that and to keep championing women in ministry definitely it's uh, so special steve i think as well one way you you can see if this is real if it's true is, is not just in what we do but in what we reproduce yeah. um and so for for example we, we have one thing we've held dear is a preaching team. Um, I, I loved a quote recently from Nicky Gumbel where he spoke to an American pastor and, and said, how often do you speak in your church? And the American pastor said, 48 times a year. And then Nicky, he asked Nicky Gumbel, and Nicky Gumbel said, I speak twice a year, but I'm trying to get it down. You know, and, and I, we've worked hard to have a team. But if you look at our team, it, it's it's there's probably more women on there than there are men so something has happened mm. which is when women feel secure to bring a voice and and they've got gifting they're as gifted as any man so 
I think the if not more so. If not more so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> the proof of the pudding is is what happens by way of fruit, not just with us. And that's it, true in every it, area. It's not like tokenism, you know, you have the you know, the women no. takeover service once a year. No. <laughs> and and then that's it. No, it's, no, it's and that is from an onlooker looking in, that's what's so special, is that you've just gone about it over years, you've not created a big ministry around it you've just quietly you know what's the what's the word says says make it your ambition to lead a quiet life working yeah. with your hands w winning the out uh, approval of the outsiders and it's you know to put that in this context just getting on with it working with your hands winning the approval is is definitely from I me think, looking in i think one thing we did realize a number of years ago was it's it's not a level playing field it's still not a level play right to men and women so unless you are intentional yeah it won't happen yeah. and, and we got very intentional as i said not everybody liked that they said you've changed exactly we have we have changed right that's all right we're supposed to change um, but we had to get very intentional of making sure around the table were the right voices to speak into it around the table we, we had to be deliberate without tokenism and that, even that's an insult why would we need to be tokenistic because the women yeah. are there and they're gifted yeah. It, it's not tokenism it's genuine gift that, yeah. that makes way for the person so i, I think that intentionality has to be there because uh, men obviously like spending time with guys and obviously would know a lot more men uh, in networks or right. relationships thinking of a role or creating a board or who you want to bring in to speak you're naturally going to think of guys because that's who you hang out with and who you right. know and who your mates are so you have to be intentional thinking Actually, this has waited too long to, towards guy speakers, for example. Who are the female speakers and who can we bring in and who can we actually champion um, in that way? And so, therefore, you have to kind of force yourself to think differently. Yeah. Uh, so there is a natural inclination towards it. So you have to go against that. So if you want to bring whole house and whole kingdom. And women respond to female speakers. Guys respond to female right. speakers. But yeah. they're a lot less around, and so there's they need that encouragement to give them an opportunity. Um, yeah. In context, right? Well, thank you for for pioneering. Pioneering is is definitely one of the words, but thank you for just consistently going and making it happen. Because I'm raising two girls, and knowing yeah. they, you know, like your your eyes are wide open, and I'm thinking there's some stuff that's so far behind uh, for where they're moving into. I just wanted to pause this amazing conversation to thank our helpers with this podcast, which is Compassion UK. Compassion are an incredible charity that help children out of poverty. And I've had the privilege of being able to partner with them, me and my wife, in helping sponsor some children, but also seen their work firsthand by going out to Kenya a couple of years ago. And I want to encourage anyone who's not yet looked into the work of Compassion, of maybe how you could partner or the community that you represent could partner, to go and look at what they do. In the UK, I think there's over 86,000 people who are actually involved in helping with compassion in the projects that they do and I know I've talked about it every time and I've only ever chosen them as a partner because I'm hugely hugely passionate about what they do because I've seen it firsthand children actually coming out of poverty being able to have meals every day being able to have school uniforms on their back and also being able to hear about Jesus is truly world changing and previously I've had the privilege of being able to speak to Justin Dowds who's the CEO of Compassion and that's well worth going to listen back to because you get to hear all about who he is and how he runs Compassion but also their heart around helping to relieve children out of poverty so I know that today Today, I'm going to be writing to my children that I help to sponsor. Um, I've got two of them and they're based over in Kenya and I involve my kids in doing that. They then write back. We're able to help them in their birthdays or special occasions. And also then they're involved with a project over there. And a project is simply them being able to go to essentially a Sunday school or a church every single week, be fed and their health checked over, be looked after. And so compassion make all of that happen. And I'm able to write to them in the most efficient way, actually, is I do it through the app, the Compassion app, which is truly amazing. 
So it's just a one big thank you to Compassion to helping me get this podcast out, but also for you guys to be able to go and look and maybe you could involve your family, maybe you could involve your community. The best way to find out more is simply go to CompassionUK.org and there's so much information and you can reach out to their team there. Well, look, let's jump straight back into the conversation with Steve and Angie. So, um, what about, I'm aware of time, I would love to ask around the 28 years again, how, you know, you've reinvented multiple times. I don't even need to know all your journey, just to understand you must have reinvented so many times. How have you like kept the church in step with the spirit? Because it would be really easy to get a church to a healthy point where it's healthy and vibrant and it needs ticking over, right? And you possess enough skills to tick it over, and I'm not, and that I don't even think there's anything particularly wrong with that. Do you know what I mean? But how have you kept that Holy Spirit? What are you doing in us? How do we keep moving, pushing, taking adventurous risks when really and truly, you know, you've got grandkids come on the way, you've got kids going through different things. You think I don't need to take a risk now. I've got all sorts of other stuff going on. How have you kept that at the core of what you do? I think, um, you know, we're talking about the books that are behind us, but. I think a key for any leader to stay fresh is to keep learning. So if if you keep learning and, and learning from maybe not always the usual pathways, we, we've just taken on the role of Global Leadership Network, UK and Ireland directors. One of the reasons we like that is it, it's a, eclectic in its nature and holistic in the speakers it gets in. It gets you thinking differently mm about things that you you know if you're just in this echo chamber everyone's saying the same thing then you just end up doing the same thing so we we deliberately put ourselves in that context um, and we've learned a lot from people in the business arena mm. I mean, it, it, we're now at the point where we have to hire we have 33 staff some of the stuff we've learned at there has helped us in shaping who our staff are and who are coming in that we wouldn't have done if we'd have just gone to your normal church conference. So that's kept us fresh. Now, part of our change was we got to a point of frustration. We've got to do something cataclysmic. Uh, and what that, year? Uh, 2004. Angela was telling me, see, it feels like so much longer ago. To, <laughs> but it's 2004. And that pre- precipitated the church split. Um, that was the first church split. And then we had one a couple of years later because of the changes we were making. Um, and it was purely because we were failing. And this, this is obviously us telling the story. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it might be someone else would tell it differently. Um, but the winners end up telling the story and we ended up staying. And so we tell the story. Um, we weren't missional. We weren't reaching people who are far away from God. We were We were prophesying together about a fresh move from God but we weren't making any moves towards reaching out beyond our, our, our safe circles. Um, so we made some dram- dramatic changes at that point to the church. Remember one lady, it's a very small thing, but we, we stopped at that point. I'm not saying it's right for everyone. This was just for us because we had so many prophetic words that were coming, which honestly were just truisms. They weren't depth wow. of prophetic words. We, we, we stopped having an open mic so everyone could have a go. Um, and one lady said to me, you've cut off my right arm, but we, we maybe had to cut off some things in order to be fruitful in other areas. Right. And it was from there and from that church split, honestly, that we started to see what was initially a trickle, but it's a steady, steady growth of non-believers, unbelievers, which is what we're here to do. We reach them coming in to the community and finding faith in Christ. Uh-huh. Um, so, so that was the cataclysmic change. I wouldn't recommend it because it's painful because you lose friendships, yeah. you lose income, um, you lose, yeah, you lose a lot. It, so you do have to grieve that. So so now what we're trying to do is much more incremental. Yeah. You know, I, we're, we're always constantly, what can we change? How can we do this? So, so even this last weekend, we've announced four different things in the church that we're finishing and one that we're starting, which is, a, which is a reinvention, not as big as it was, but to keep us on task, to keep us on focus. And are some of those, are some of those like senses of the Holy Spirit, others are just good leadership wisdom decisions 
where would you position it uh, you know in your style of leadership you know because it's easy isn't it as a church leader to say god's really feel like god's telling me this and who's going to argue if it's god right you can't really argue with someone if it's god um i think god's put a blueprint in us and when we actually wrote down the church we see we felt that was a kind of a download that god had given us of a vision of what he wanted us to build with him and so yeah, that that's what we keep going back to is like the vision of the church that god's got and, and god's church in our hearts is a large place where it's a place where people can come where can people can find family people can it'll get saved they find community but also it's a church that's making an impact into the society mm. so it's a, in an impact in community it's it's affecting people when they're struggling with their bills and uh, lack of food and you know actually making a big impact not only that but into the you know, the council you know the local councils that they know about us they know that we're there for transformation mm. we're now with the gls uh, their summit that we're now we're looking to impact you know businesses within the city as well to impact that that there's we're here for the good of the city so i think god's given us a blueprint and along the way we hear god's spirit to tweak things i think any organization if you don't keep on reinventing it it goes downwards and it just it, it actually folds in on itself you have so, to keep on thinking what's the next phase that god's got for us yeah what about friendships so if you've gone through you know you went through this huge you call it cataclysmic and then you've had various iterations of change i can only imagine that you know you set out 28 years ago with a friendship group and you raise kids together and then surely along the way you know there's the hurt and the disappointment of people moving on how have you as a couple the family navigated that you are absolutely right and we've been through some some pain in that um we, we've had two major splits uh, together where we, we call them splits now they they're churches that exist in the city now which are actually different than us and it's really quite good because if someone comes to us and they say oh i want this well we know where to send them because yeah. <laughs> they're not going to be any good to us or yeah. themselves in yeah, a place yeah mission so that that's all right you know we, we can do that now in peace um but 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 there were hurts along the way i was talking to someone again two days ago who said oh you were really close with x and y weren't you how did that feel and and i went back in my mind this was a couple we'd gone on holiday with kids mm. that they had the same age as us and it really felt very very painful and we watched the pain in our kids yeah that that was what was really horrible because they couldn't they didn't understand why there was yeah. these people leaving suddenly, and a lot of the blame was coming back to us. Is you know because of Steve and Angie, so watching them and the pain they went through what was painful. It, mm -hmm. it was yeah. It, it, I think I think what we didn't do at the time, which we would do now, we probably didn't grieve our losses well enough. Mm. we were too gung-ho we've got to get on you know <laughs> and and i think now i'd pause longer and do something to help me heal yeah uh, for me i and just coped with it better and you went on a whole journey i think which is where life thrive comes in of understanding yourself better and uh, so it's personality profiling yeah, stuff yeah. And that's really helped us yeah um because everyone who interviews, we go through this life thrive process, but it helps us understand ourselves better. And I, and I think in the past we didn't really understand. And I think, I think in the past we were too spiritual. Of this is all the Holy Spirit, you know. Right. We, uh, we still want the Holy Spirit to lead us. We, we still believe in that. But but you know, some stuff out there can just be good common sense wisdom that may not have a Holy Spirit tag on it, but really really is what you need to hear at any given time so like patrick lencioni whether you've heard of him yeah stuff he wrote about really helped us with our interviewing processes well was that the holy spirit i don't know maybe the holy spirit led us to go to gln hear him yeah. he is a man of faith now i don't think he was he doesn't write from a faith perspective right it's just helped to inform our decisions wow what about yourself with friendship and um I think, uh, yeah, definitely that time was very difficult with friendships and definitely was people we were growing up with, the kids grew up with, and a lot of people left. Um, and I think it, it can, if you don't deal with it, it can make you feel um, that you put an arbor up and that you don't let close to you because you don't want it to happen to you again. 
um, so you protect yourself. And I think uh, one thing over COVID actually that I read from Sam Chand, um, he was saying about the price of leadership is pain and you'll only go as far as the pain that you can endure will be the level of your leadership. It will be capped at the level of pain that you can cope with. Right. And I think um, the pain that we went through I remember I used to lead a women's Bible study at that time and, and the verse I was looking at at that time was when Jesus was going to the cross and he said, if this cup could be taken away from me, yeah. take it away, but if not, your will be done. Yeah. And that became my verse. You know, I, I didn't want to have to walk through it. And yeah. if that cup could have been taken away, then Lord, take it. But through it all, God grew us. God, God grew me in my leadership, definitely. Um, so I've seen purpose through the pain as well. And so I, I've I've not kept away from people, but I've been aware that it's part of the consequence of leadership, and especially the city we're in. People come and people go. People come and people go. So you kind of can't take things personally quite so deeply. Yeah. You can't think, oh, you know, they're leaving because of you. It could be because of you, but actually you have to release them and release them to God. You have to have a an open heart, and then do what you need to do to grieve that, to actually talk you through and pray to that. Yeah. You have to keep open to that. Um, I love the work of Brenny Brown. She talks yeah. about wholeheartedness, you know, and those who actually keep moving forward, do wholeheartedly, authentically grieve, mourn, talk about things, and then are able to leave it and to move on. Um, so, yeah, I think wow. it's been a long process, but we've tried to get to that place where, Things don't cripple us perhaps quite so much as they did in the early days. Yeah. I think as well, um, we, we've been used to a network in the past. And this was just us. When we came out of that network where we were supposed to have friends mm -hmm. because we're all in covenant together, but they realized we didn't really have friends. Mm -hmm. um, we were determined not to stay. So we went independent, but we didn't want to be independent. Mm. So we worked really hard then at connecting across streams and denominations. And uh, there was a forum created, a friend of ours now, who really is probably our closest friend in England, uh, Stuart Bell, who created a forum with other church leaders coming together. And, and, I would, and that started about the same time, 2004. Mm. I, I would say some of my closest friends now and our closest friends are from that forum. Mm. Where it felt like we started on the same page. Nice. Certain things you just didn't have to say because everyone yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so we will spend time with all, all of those throughout the year and find those are refreshing relationships. Wow. There are friendships in the church. I don't believe, we don't believe that you can't have friendships in the church. Yeah. One of the greatest pleasures for us was when our da youngest daughter married a guy in the church, um, but we, we were friends with the parents, oh, you know, wow. already. So, you know, them, them getting married, it felt like this isn't just a family thing. We were yeah. deep friends. They can't, they can't split the church and they'll take a church because that would be awful. <laughs> <laughs> <The only one. laughs> Our daughter's moved away. Yeah. <laughs> um, our greatest pleasure has been our family, bringing our family up and, and spending time with them, hanging out with them. We always, well, we, most years we go on holiday together, even though two of our, um, our kids, Josh and Becky, are in the church with working with us. And then Dorothy and Locator, he wakes, works with us. And yet we still go on holiday with each other and spend time together. So that has definitely been our greatest yeah. triumph and our greatest uh, reward, really, has been our family. Right. Yeah. And the tree is known by its fruit. And I know Josh and Becky. Um, I don't know Megan. Is it Megan? You, you yeah. Know, I, don't, I don't really know Megan as well. But um, amazing kids you know and who love their mum and dad i always think that's you know deeply love their mum and dad and want to be with their mum and dad and i'm raising three kids and some days i don't want to be with them so i'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> oh i need a little bit of wisdom from the camels is what i need so it's like, good, and it's the real deal you know when people talk about you guys is the real deal it just is there is no smoke screens mirrors it kind of is you know and i'm sure there's you know you referenced it earlier i'm sure there's people who've got stories but you know there's people who've got lots of stories about me as well and so you know we've all got the that 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 side as well can i ask, i'm aware of time because we had a pre-talk and i talked a lot um and for those for anyone listening these guys are running the global leadership summit here in the uk and so maybe at the end if you could tell us a little bit about that that'd be great but I would also want to find out your thoughts on the church, what you're excited about, just 
generically around. But can I ask one question that I heard Paul Scanlon asking someone the other day? He said, what's your favourite fail in 28 years? <laughs> what's your favourite favorite fail? What a great question. <laughs> favourite fail. And then you have to say why, of course, that's a <laughs> fail. Um, Don't they were failed? <laughs> that was my favorite fail. <laughs> Pride. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, there's things that we've tried which clearly haven't worked. I mean, I, I, when I think of failure, see, for me, I I was thinking of an incident in my life. Um, I used to lead worship at Bible Weeks. Yeah. In fact, Paul Scanlon used to be involved in that. I remember him telling me, you've got to wear makeup before you go on because they're, they're going to put it on. I had bear there. Um, but one one year in um, 94, I think it was, or, or 95, I, I did a rap that was at the start of the Bible week, and it went down brilliantly. Okay. People loved it, engaged in it. It was fun. It was quirky. So the next year, they told me I had to do it again or find another one, and it was an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> uh, and the whole of the service was, and I remember <laughs> in the service, you've got 5,000 people in front of you, trying to get it back and trying to, and at the end of it, they called me over, the powers that be, and they said, you, you won't be leading again now for the next couple of nights. Oh. Um <laughs> And it felt like an epic failure. And I felt like I said to Ange, I'm, I'm never going to lead again, never going to lead again. Now, they did let me on three nights later and it went very well. But what it taught me was I couldn't let that failure define me so as I didn't get back up and lead again. Wow. Um, which was three days later. And thankfully, it, it went well. And I had a blossoming worship <laughs> leading career after that. Um, I, I, but I think what it taught me was I was more intimidated by the leaders who were trying to tell me what I should be doing because I, I had one rap. I now have two raps, by the way, because I did yeah. another one a few weeks ago, <laughs> ah. Holy, which has gone, just gone so far with some guys in this church. Okay. But if you go to me a few weeks ago, I just had only had one rap. Well, uh, now I have two. the age of all the other people that are on this rap. <laughs> well, can we Google this rap? Is it on a YouTube? Oh, you can. If you, if you Google Spirit Holy, and you put C3, you'll get it on YouTube. Okay, okay, there we go, there we go. He is doing our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great fail, a favourite fail. And what about yourself? Favourite fail, oh gosh. Um, do you want a heavy, a, a serious heavy one? Yeah, do you want a light one? You know? I, I'll go, I'll go wherever you go. Go wherever, which way? I remember um, having a, a, build, a guy in the church here, uh, in the church in the house, a builder, and he started asking me questions. Um, about Steve, and he was asking me uh, what I thought about uh, various things that had happened in the house. Where he, he'd been with us for nine months, and he'd seen an awful lot that had gone in our household. And I started offloading some negative stuff about uh, what I wasn't happy about, what he'd done about with the kids or whatever. Um, and as I was talking, he was egging me on and and actually getting me to talk more and more. And just at the corner of my eye, I saw Steve in the background and he was listening. So that was <laughs> a big <laughs> so I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and I was like, taught me good style. God, <laughs> actually need to talk to my husband about the stuff that was that happy. And, that, and I'd forgotten all about that. <laughs> I thought you were going to remind me constantly. <laughs> Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Future of the church, Ange, what are you excited about for, you know, you've just, you've just tell us a little bit about the Global Leadership Summit and what that actually means. That is, I know it's about leadership, but it has a, a great church building dynamic to it as well. What are you, you know, what are you excited about for the next 10 years of church building? Yeah, looking at leaders really taking their place, really stepping up, really seeing um, leaders take the role that God's got over them and have seen transformation in society. We've got a massive opportunity with Global Leadership uh, Leadership Summit of going into prisons throughout the country, um, which God has just opened the door. We weren't looking for it. Just during the pandemic, we had a phone call. We'd live streamed our service on a Sunday morning. They rang us up and said, can we put this into prisons? And we said, oh, let's think about that. And so every single week throughout the pandemic and still now, our service on a 9.30 goes into prisons across the country. We now have the opportunity to bring GLS into that. I see more and more churches stepping into the opportunity that we have 
to transform society. I see more and more people engaging with local government, actually getting involved and being serious about the impact that we can make as Christians. I believe Christians are being less timid about who they are because we know we have something to offer. I know, um, I think it was Chris Kandaya told us recently, said the government needs us, um, that through the pandemic, they were thinking of asking the military or going to the church. And they came to the church because we knew that we were organized, that we could actually pivot quickly, that we could make an impact in society. So they want to work with us because we know we can make an impact and a difference. So as churches are standing taller, leaders are getting stronger, they're feeling the call that actually we can transform this station and yeah. beyond. Oh, man. So. Brilliant. So One role we've taken on this year, which is exciting, as well as a director's global leadership network, we are um, the chaplain to the mayor of Cambridge. Uh -huh. um, and so we get to go to the council meetings and we're allowed to address them for about five or 10 minutes. Now, what we've sought to do is communicate in such a way that doesn't put them off. We've, we've talked about issues of trust. We've talked about issues of, of patience and perseverance and serving. We've used the Bible, but it hasn't been a direct preach. They've gone so well talking to them, uh, the responses we've had. But it feels like we're being an influence into that realm. Wow. Um, um, and that, that didn't come overnight. That came by being here for the long haul. So in the next few weeks, we've got this service that we're taking. So uh, we're going to be walking in, but it's the Queen's chaplain that's speaking. It was going to be me, but she, but she's bumped me off because yeah. <laughs> the Queen's chaplain there. But it feels like we've got an inroad and, and into those kind of, so doing that kind of stuff excites us. Yeah. And if I can just add what Anne said, so that I've taken on GL, GLN, GLS, raising up leaders and seeing them so I, I i do not honestly don't mind sitting in a service where i do absolutely nothing i don't actually believe i never do nothing because my presence yeah yeah just does something if that doesn't sound arrogant but i'm i'm not really or we're not really needed in some contexts or doesn't feel like we are but that's because we're given the platform for others and that is one of the greatest joys, especially when you've been helped to shape that leader into who they are. Yeah. It's just it's just the most fulfilling. It, it's more fulfilling than doing it yourself. Wow. You're speaking like true grandparents. That's how you're speaking <laughs> like. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, how, how, tell us, if anyone listening, Global, you, you, Global Leadership Summit, what's happening here in the UK? How could they find out more about it? They can find out more about it by going to the website, which is globalleadership.uk. So globalleadership.uk. On there is listed all the sites, all the potential speakers. Um, well, potential. We, we're not using them all that, that are on there. We're using a, a subset of them, and then we'll release the others. I mean, there's some great speakers. On. Oh, they might even want to host a site themselves and host a, a, a GLS summit, a group of 10 people or more, gather them together. Um, and actually use the material will help you guide you along the way but maybe you want to gather some leaders in your church or in your community and go through some of those materials see transformation come right we, we honestly believe that in the nation after covid and this is in every area there is a leadership vacuum or, or a moral principled integrous leadership vacuum should we put it like that and gln and gls can really help for that and the, the goal is not leadership. It's what Anisha said. The goal is transformation. Mm. What we love about leadership is if, if one of our GLM mantras is if a leader gets better, everyone wins. Mm. So we see it as if a leader gets better, everyone around them rises up. It's like the tide coming in. Mm. Every boat rises. So if we can get leadership to rise, it affects everything around them. So everyone benefits. Mm. And that's our goal ultimately. So as the whole of society benefits. Oh, I mean, it's so encouraging to hear what you're doing and what God's done. And I mean, it doesn't do it justice at all. The small amount of time we sat um, and chatted for 28 years of what you've laid your lives down for. But I want to just say thank you. Thank you for, you know, being a church in the nation that we can be proud of saying, hey, look at this great church. Look at, I mean, I know, you know your kids, Becky and Josh a bit, and they've been such a blessing. I know when we've bumped into each other, you've always cheered me on and everything. And so I just think, wow. And my prayer would be that God's going to do great things with the the next part of your ministry with GLS and the churches that you planted. And 
who knows what's going to happen but it sounds really exciting and and so a huge huge thank you and thanks for being with us today and well well done to you as well especially i know what you've been doing here and seeking to speak into your repairing context as well to to link that a little bit with gls is one of the things we love because it is global and we can learn so much from people in you know the southern hemisphere and europe as well so it's not just one area we're learning from and that's what we like about glm actually it's such a global impact but yeah. well done to you as well Rich. Ah, you're Great. encouraging thank you and lord we also pray that liverpool beat napoli tonight in jesus name <laughs> <laughs> amen amen glory to god hallelujah <laughs> Oh, it was so good to be able to speak to them for that short time and dig into 28 years. I really hope that you enjoyed it and doing this to encourage as many people uh, that will listen to be encouraged about building local church. If you have anyone that you think I should interview or anyone I should chat to, why don't you just drop me a DM on socials or email me rich at richmartin.co.uk. Hey, thank you so much. Have a great, great rest of your week.